Okay, most important concept in, well, I mean, this is just me talking because I'm a physics guy, but most important concept in Science 10, work energy theorem. Okay, comes back again over and over and over again in Physics 20, Physics 30. Okay, probably the most important overarching concept there is okay, in physics is the work energy theorem. Nothing gets done without the work energy theorem. All right, it t it uh, what it does is it talks about how you uh, you transform how how work can transfer energy to something else, how you have to have energy to do work, how you get the energy you need to do work. It's a very much a chicken and the egg kind of thing. You know, if you can't you don't have one, you can't do the other and and things like that. But it is obviously um, how any and all things get done, okay, in the world. All right, we cannot do work if we don't have energy, okay? And uh, work obviously requires energy, right? So we'll be looking at that. Um, so we got to look at what the work energy theorem is, that work and energy can be numerically equal. Okay, they can be numerically equal, but one cannot exist without the other. Okay, uh, understand both kinetic and potential energy. Okay, and um, so we'll be looking at those in terms of mechanical energy. Um, and then understand the relationship between force and work. All right, so we got to go over a few things uh, that are going to be new. Now, how does acceleration fit into all of this? Well, if you're going to change the velocity of something, okay, that requires a force. Okay, if you're going to make something go faster or make something go slower, a force has to be exerted on it. Right? Otherwise, you, nothing's going to happen. The object's either going to sit where it is or it's going to continue moving at a constant velocity. Without a force, that's not going to happen. Now, when you exert a force, okay, you usually have to use energy. Okay, and when you're using energy, you're doing four-letter word starts with W. Work. <laughs> okay, so that's that's how this all kind of relates. Okay, acceleration doesn't happen without force. Force doesn't happen without energy. Anytime you use energy, you're doing work. So it all kind of ties together. Okay. So energy, just like anything else, it's a measurable sort of measurable quantity. Okay? Specifically, energy is a measure of an object or a system's capacity to do work. I would say that that's a pretty important, well, that's a terrible color to use. Okay? A very important definition there. All right, if I lift a brick up off the ground and hold it above my toe, okay, the brick has potential energy because I have done work in lifting it off the ground. I've exerted a force through a distance. I've changed its velocity from nothing to something. I've changed its position from a place where there's no energy to a place where there is some. Okay, All of that required work, and now it has the potential to do work were I to drop it. All right. Another good example of that would be the mousetrap. Okay. How many people have used a mousetrap before? Okay. So, I mean, you know you got to be careful with the thing, right? Because it means designed to break bones. Right. That's how they work. Um, so when you uh, when you load it, okay, you have to essentially change the shape of the spring, okay, by lifting this. What's that called? See, most of us don't know what the parts of the mouse trap are called. That's the killing bar. Aptly named. That's what it does. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have to lift the killing bar, and when you do that, okay, it loads the spring. It changes the shape of the spring. It puts tension in the spring. Do you have to exert a force to do that? Yeah, you pull, right? You pull on this thing. You pull it and push it down onto the other side so that you can hook the trigger bar into the trigger. Okay. Is this the, here? Is the trigger? Okay. This is the trigger bar, right? When the th when the mouse steps on on the trigger, okay, it releases the trigger bar, and then all the work that you did in loading the uh, the mouse trap, okay, putting potential energy into the spring, becomes kinetic energy, and the killing bar flies forward, okay, and when it does that, it's converting the potential energy that was in the spring into what? What kind of energy? Because now it's moving. Kinetic. Okay. Once it's once that potential energy gets converted into kinetic. Okay. In either case, did the mouse trap, when it was loaded, have the ability to do work? It did. Okay. The spring was loaded. It had the ability to do work. When the trigger is triggered, okay, it does the work. It exerts a force through a distance, usually on some unfortunate little rodent-like animal. Okay. Everyone, follow me there. 
right? Now, how do we know it does work? Well, work is a change in energy. Sometimes we see that evidenced as a change in shape of something. Does the mouse change shape? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that's unfortunately what the the mouse trap's designed to do. Okay. And that's the evidence that work gets done. Other evidence that work gets done. If you actually manually fire the the mouse trap. Okay. Say you've had it in the garage and one of those sneaky mice got in there and ate all the peanut butter off of it. Okay. And it didn't trigger. Okay. You're not going to load it up with peanut butter while it's loaded, are you? Okay. If you do that, you will have a broken finger. Okay, you don't want to do that. So you trigger it on your own. Okay, when you trigger it, can you hear it? Yeah. Okay, makes noise. Is sound a form of energy? Okay. Well, then there was energy stored in the mouse trap. Okay. Um, if you trigger it, does it usually bounce off the floor? Okay. Again, it's converting that potential energy into kinetic energy. Okay. All evidence that the work you did in loading it was still there. Right. It was just being stored as elastic potential energy in the spring. Okay, so when you change the shape of something, that counts as work. And we change the shape of the spring by loading it up. All right, other definition. Work is the transfer of energy from one object to a, or system to another. And we should point out that this energy is mechanical energy. Okay, work deals with mechanical energy. Heat deals with thermal energy, right? Okay, how many people have ever played tennis? Babington works essentially the same way. Okay, any racket sport uh, is essentially the same. Um, when you hit a tennis ball with your racket, we say the ball has had work done on it. Okay, because when I throw the ball up in the air, okay, all of its movement is vertical. It has essentially, as long as I throw it straight, it doesn't have any horizontal um, component to its movement. Okay, but when I strike it with the tennis racket, okay, do I change its velocity in the horizontal plane? Okay, well, if I'm changing its velocity, is it accelerating? Okay, does that require a force? So I had to do work. Okay, now here's the thing a lot of things are, uh, sorry, this, the final speed of the tennis ball is dependent on a number of things. Okay, one of those things is my own strength. How fast can I swing the tennis racket? Okay, certainly how fast you swing the tennis racket is part of how fast you can make the ball go. Right? Another part of that is technique. Okay, how, how good uh, you know, are you at serving? Do you hit it in the right spot on the racket? Is it getting in the center? Is it hitting the frame? Okay, things like that. Um, and then thirdly would be how good my equipment is. All right? I mean, obviously, there's you know, different grades of tennis racket. You know, I could go to you know, Walmart and buy the cheapest one. And I, you know, for me, I probably wouldn't know the difference. Right? But for someone who plays tennis all the time, they would notice a difference okay, between a really good racket and a not so good racket because their technique is good, their strength is good, and they'll notice if they're not getting the same energy transfer. They're not doing the same amount of work on a tennis ball as they would with a good racket. Okay? So a number of things happen. And you can see that kind of in this kind of bullet time picture here, okay, where we, we can see what's going on with the with the ball. So the ball gets tossed, and that's what we can see here is actually the ball near the top of its arc, okay, where it's slowing down, slowing down, instantaneously coming to a stop before falling back. Okay. When the racket strikes the ball, and unfortunately they don't have a shot of that, okay, um, the ball, if you can catch it while the racket's hitting it, will actually appear behind the frame. Okay, so um, Here's the frame of the racket if we're looking at it straight on, okay? And then the webbing of the racket is stretchy, okay? It's like nylon, right? So it's uh, it's stretchy, and when you hit the hit the ball, that webbing goes back behind, and the ball is actually in here, right? So if you can catch it at that instant, you can see that the uh, the tennis racket's frame is ahead of the ball. The ball is behind the racket in the frame, and it's having work done on it. Does that make the webbing better than a hard surface? Yeah, it's better than swinging a paddle. Okay, there's a reason that tennis is played with rackets with webbing as opposed to big paddles. Okay, there's a few reasons. First off, it's much harder to swing a big paddle. Right, it's heavier, and air doesn't go through it; it goes around it, and that makes it harder to swing it at a high rate of speed. The other reason is is a paddle is inflexible. 
right? Which means the tennis ball will not stay in contact with it as long as it will stay in contact with the racket. Because if the ball can go back behind the frame, it's almost like the racket carries and pushes the ball as opposed to just striking it and having it bounce off. Okay, everyone kind of follow me there? There's two things that affect how much work you can do. The force you can exert, so that would be my strength, okay? and the distance over which I can exert that force. It doesn't matter what sport you play. These two things are crucial to you playing it well. Okay, um, In tennis, the greater the distance over which I can exert my strength on this racket, or on this ball, the faster the ball is going to go. Everyone follow me on that one? Okay, so having this racket be flexible like that, okay, allows me to exert the force over a greater distance and then as a result do more work. Because here's the formula for work. Work equals force times distance. Okay, and work, we've already said, is a change in energy. So if I want to change the energy of the ball as much as possible, I need to exert as much force as possible over as great a distance as possible. Okay, Having an elastic um, material inside the racket, the webbing there, allows me to do that. Okay, uh, Modern hockey sticks, Okay, same thing. Back in the day, okay, uh, it, sticks were made of a piece of tree. Okay, like they were all wood. Okay, that's where Sherwood came from. Okay, right? It was all wood. That was what your stick was made out of. Okay, it wood was somewhat flexible, but not like the composite material sticks are made out of today. Okay, like if you look at um, some, you know, NHL players taking a, a slap shot, the stick is bent like 70 degrees from vertical sometimes. Okay, now when they do that, okay, if I've got, let's just kind of draw it here. Okay, so if I've got, let's say, just a wooden stick that's not flexible, the area over which I can exert the force on the puck might be represented by that. But if the stick will bend, okay, the area over which I can make contact with the puck now might be this big. Okay, is that a greater distance over which I'm exerting force? Really, Taylor? Okay, is that a greater distance? If D is bigger, and F is the same, which stick is going to hit the puck faster? The more bendable one, because I'm multiplying by a bigger D. Okay, And as a result, the energy of that, of that puck now is going to be much greater, and it's going to be moving much faster. All right, Does that sort of make sense to people? Okay, um, yeah. And so basically any sport, with the exception of baseball. Baseball is essentially the only sport that has not endorsed high-tech materials into it. They instead choose performance enhancing drugs in order to make force greater. I'm knocking baseball. Sorry, Daniel. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, in, instead, honestly, baseball has, I mean, a Louisville slugger is still a piece of tree. Okay. It's just a big wooden stick. Right? Uh, it's not high tech in any way. All right? But if you're bigger and stronger, you're going to exert more force. So baseball is focused more on this part of the equation than it has on modifying the equipment okay, in order to make D bigger. Right? And that's just the way it is. But it doesn't mean that okay, uh, the science of, of sport is any different for baseball. Okay? Having good technique okay, can, can be important, but obviously being strong makes a big difference. Right? You don't see a lot of really skinny home run hitters. Okay. Um, now, uh, trying to think of other sport examples here. Track and field's got a whole bunch, but I won't bore you to death with those because okay? I know too much about it and I'll get off on a tangent. Okay. Um, but you know, basically any sport, it's important. Okay. Um, looking at even things like shoes. Okay. Making your shoes have better grip and better traction allows you to run faster. Right? Because you have less slippage. That means that that you can exert more force before the shoe gives away and slides. Okay, and that allows you obviously to increase your kinetic energy better. All right, so things like that. It's it's part of everything. All right. Um, so is that sort of making sense? All right. So now this formula is on your formula sheet. Okay, delta E equals work equals force times distance. Right. So work and energy are they going to be scalar or vector?
Okay, before you answer, you ate breakfast this morning. I'm assuming most of you did anyway. Um, that food energy you ate is going to get converted into chemical energy in your body. Does that have direction? No. Okay. You don't say that that hamburger I ate has, you know, well, not that you'd eat a hamburger for breakfast, but, okay, that hamburger I ate has, uh, you know, 1,500 calories north. Okay, or 1,500 joules north. It doesn't make any sense, right? Energy is your ability to do work. It doesn't. It can't, by definition, then have a direction. It's your ability to do something. You could do it in whatever direction you want. Okay, when you do work, okay, work is also scalar. Okay, work is a change in energy. It can be positive or negative, but that's only a matter of did you give energy away or did you receive it. It's not a matter of direction. This, on the other hand, force is vector. What you do with that energy, how you perform that work. That can have direction. Which way did I push? Okay. Which way did I pull? Right. Things like that. That can have direction. Right. But work and energy are scalar quantities. Right. Okay. Is that everyone's okay with that? That's kind of the most important concept. There is understanding how those things go together. All right. And that's the relationship we're going to spend quite a bit of time on. All right. Work is also related to the force acting on an object. Okay, the greater the force, the more work is done, assuming the objects are the same mass. Okay, mass also affects the amount of work done as a more massive object requires more energy to move to a, to a identical speed as a smaller object. Okay, um, so another example here would be a bow and arrow. Okay, in order to shoot a bow and arrow, you have to pull back on the string. Okay, it's called a draw. You have to draw back on the string. Okay, is that a force? Pulling is a force, right? So um, if I'm fairly strong, I can probably pull back on the string further than someone who's not as strong as me. Agreed? All right. That means that with my greater force, I'm also going to stretch the string or change the bow's shape over a greater distance. Okay? And as a result, I'll have more potential energy stored in the bow than a person who's not strong enough to pull the bow as far. Okay? Everyone okay with that? All right. What is it that allows you to shoot something in a bow and arrow? Like we, we say we pull back the string, but when you pull back the string, what do you do to the bow? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a tension. Okay? When you deform something that is elastic, it wants to go back to its normal shape. Okay? This is what ancient man discovered. They looked at small trees and they found that when they bent them and let them go, they sprung back to straight again. Okay? This is an important discovery. It allowed them to develop the bow. Okay? If we put a piece of string between two ends and we pull back on the string, we force the ends closer together. When we let the string go, the wood tries to regain its former shape. Okay? And then anything that's on the string gets shot out. All right? It means the same thing for, uh, uh, for a slingshot, really, except that you don't change the shape of the slingshot. You actually change the shape of the elastic band that's in the slingshot. Right? But the idea is the same. You change the shape of something by exerting a force through a distance and giving it potential energy. All right? Depending on the material the bow is made out of, okay, that, may or, that may have more ability to store energy, okay, maybe easier to draw back, okay, and things like that. Like If you look at really modern, I think they're called compound bows, the ones with the pulleys in them, Right? Yeah, okay. You can pull those back with less force because the pulleys help you. Okay? Pulleys are like a circular lever, right? And and they allow you to essentially do more work than you should be able to. Okay? All right. Um like we said, mass is also important because when we look at any of the types of energy that we're going to deal with, okay? Um, and I'm just going to go down to here. Okay? The types of energy that we're going to deal with are gravitational potential energy and and kinetic energy. Okay, they are both affected by mass. Okay, these formulas are also on your formula sheet. Okay, um, potential energy is affected by mass. It's affected by the acceleration due to gravity. So this number here for us is always going to be 9.81, right? The acceleration due to gravity on Earth, and it's affected by height, right? And, we, and when we think about that, that should be obvious. Okay, if I you know, if 
there's two things that are going to fall off of a roof, and I have to choose which one hits me. Okay? They're both falling off the same roof. And one's a piano, and one's a feather. Why am I picking the feather? It's not going to have as much energy because it doesn't have as much mass. They're both going to fall from the same height. They're both going to fall at the same rate, assuming it's in a vacuum because the feather would do this, obviously, in, in the air. Okay? Um, but yeah, mass is important. Mass is a big factor okay, in potential energy. Mass is also a big factor in kinetic energy. Okay? Again, you have two objects heading towards you on the street. You have to step in front of one of them. Okay? One's a bus and one's a kid on a tricycle. Okay? You're picking the kid on the tricycle. All right? Assuming they're traveling at the same speed, I pick the kid on the tricycle. Now, if the kid on the tricycle is moving at the speed of sound, I'll step in front of the bus. Okay? Wow, the kid's dead already. If he's on a tricycle, he's moving at the speed of sound. He's already like ablating in the, uh, in the, I guess, with the friction against the air, so he'll have bigger problems than that. But okay, yeah. Um, does everyone kind of understand how mass is important there? Okay. Now, height's important for potential energy. Okay. Again, if I, if you know, if I have to choose between two objects, but one's dropped from this far above my head and one's dropped from two stories above my head, I want to pick the one that's dropped from this far above my head. Okay. Because it's not going to hurt as much. It wasn't dropped from as high, so it doesn't have as much potential energy. It's not going to hurt. Okay. Same idea here. If I got two kids on tricycles headed towards me, and one is actually pedaling the thing legitimately, he's probably not going that fast. Okay. And the other one is, let's say, somehow going 50 kilometers an hour. Right. Well, I'm going to step in front of the one that the kid's actually pedaling because it's going to have way less energy, okay, because it's moving slower, right? And the weird thing about kinetic energy, guys, is that kinetic energy and speed have an exponential relationship, okay? We'll talk more about that in a little bit, but essentially what that means is if you're moving twice as fast as another object of similar mass, you don't have twice as much energy as that object. You have four times as much energy, okay? If you're moving three times as fast, you have nine times as much energy. Okay? It's an exponential relationship. Speed affects energy and the ability to do work exponentially. Okay? I'll show you an example of that okay, a little bit later uh, that you should learn in driver's ed but never do. Okay. All right, so for uh, work here, guys, the, the important thing here, okay, uh, the greater the force, okay, the more work is done. Okay? Um, that's, that's obviously an important relationship there. Okay, distance, same thing. The greater the distance over which you exert the force, okay, the more work is done. Okay. Now, this formula is also on your formula sheet, but we almost never use it. Okay? We talk about it a little bit, but it's never really part of any problem solving or calculations. Okay? And that is force equals mass times acceleration. Okay? This is Newton's second law. All right, we talked about his first law of inertia the other day. Okay, this is Newton's second law. Um, basically, what it says is, is that if uh, you exert a certain amount of force on a mass, you'll produce a certain acceleration. Okay. Now, if that mass is really small, if that mass is really small, the acceleration will be really big. Okay. If the mass is really big, the acceleration will be really small. All right, and so that's the thing we see here. Okay, if this guy with the golf club uses the golf club in the proper fashion, that is to hit a golf ball. Okay, the force he can exert with his swing is fixed; it's a certain amount. Okay, and he exerts that on a small mass, he produces a great acceleration on the ball. If he winds up and smokes this truck, okay, with his golf club, okay, is the truck even going to move? Probably not. Okay? It's not going to roll forward as a result of being hit by a golf club. Does that mean, though, that he didn't produce an acceleration? Actually, he did. And we know that because we see the evidence of the work he's done on the truck. When he hits the truck, he's doing work on the truck. It's just that the truck doesn't actually move all as one unit, but parts of it do. Will there be a dent where he hits the truck? 
Okay, a dent is a change in shape. That counts as work. All right, if I'm standing here at the front of the truck and I've got my hand on the front of the truck, am I going to know when he hits the truck? I'm going to feel the vibration pass through the truck. Okay, he made every single particle in that truck move. They just didn't all move in the same direction. Okay, they vibrated and I can feel that. And that's evidence of work. Will I hear when he hits the truck? Sounds a form of energy. Okay, all of that is evidence that yes, he did produce an acceleration, it just didn't result in the truck actually rolling forward. Right? Now, if he was to do that in space, he could actually make the truck move. Not very much. Okay? It wouldn't accelerate very much, but it would actually move. Okay? The problem is, is that if he did that in space, he would fly back from the truck. Okay? Right, like I'll show you here. I think you would agree the wall is more massive than me. The correct answer is yes. The wall is far more massive than me. If I exert a force on the wall, what's the wall going to do? It's going to stay. Okay? There'll be an acceleration, you'll, you'll know, but it's not going to be the same as mine. Okay? When I exert a force on the wall, the wall exerts a force back on me. Okay. Right? The wall's bigger than me. It accelerated. Okay? It, it cracked and vibrated. If someone was on the, someone in the prep room would probably go, what the heck just happened? Okay? Right? Because that, that sound goes through there. It's paper thin. Right? Um, but the idea here is that there was an acceleration. There was a vibration in the wall. Okay? Things like that. The smart board kind of jiggled a little bit. Okay? And, and I moved back. Okay? I got an acceleration too. Right? Okay. So motion doesn't have to mean necessarily movement. Motion can mean a change in the state of something. And I don't mean solid, liquid, and gas here. I mean in its energetic state. Um, if we're talking about a spring or a bow and arrow or anything elastic, changing the shape results in potential energy being stored in that, in the form of elastic potential energy. Okay? Picking something up off the floor and putting it on a, on a table changes its energetic state in that now it's above the ground and it can fall, so it has gravitational potential energy. Okay, so in this unit, when we say changing state, we actually mean its energetic state and not its state of matter. Okay, all right, and so that's what we see here with a spring, either stretching a spring or compressing a spring. Either way, okay, we'll store energy in it. All right, if it, if that wasn't the case, it wouldn't require work to do any a change in shape in either direction. Okay? We know that to push the spring's ends together, we have to push. Okay? If I want to stretch it out, I've got to pull. Okay? Either way, I'm getting potential energy in there. All right? So, when an object is compressed or stretched, okay? The atoms within it are moved, okay? And we would call that um, elastic potential energy. Now, um, work and heat are also transfers of energy. Okay? When the molecules of two objects originally at different temperatures come into contact with each other, okay, they collide, they transfer energy. Right? Just so that we have a little bit of the, uh, the thermal stuff in here. Jen, can you let Mike in there? Okay, um, that's still, when we're right down at the molecular level or atomic level, okay, that's still mechanical energy. It's these tiny little particles running into each other, but on the bigger scale, we call it thermal because they're actually transferring okay, uh, thermal energy back and forth. Okay, okay so um, just underlying that, that's kind of the definition for heat. Okay, Heat is a transfer of thermal energy, okay, whereas work is a transfer of mechanical energy. For potential energy, if you're going to have potential energy, okay, and we looked at the formula for it here a minute ago, um, the object has to be where, or anywhere but where, anywhere but on the ground, okay? Anywhere it could fall, right? As long as it is above the ground, it will have gravitational potential energy, okay? Now there also has the object also obviously has to have mass, but 
I don't know of any massless object out there, so okay, that's kind of by default it would have mass. And the other thing is, is that there has to be sufficient gravity that the object will fall. Now on Earth, that's not a problem. Okay, we know there's sufficient gravity on Earth for all things lifted off the surface to fall back. Okay, um, but if you are a great distance away from the Earth, that may not be true anymore, or at least not to the same extent as it is when you're close to the Earth's surface. Okay. Um, for example, on the International Space Station, everybody appears weightless. They actually aren't. Um, it's apparent weightlessness. They are still attracted to the Earth. Um, the problem is, is that they're always falling when they're on the International Space Station. Okay. Yeah, that got some weird looks. Okay. When, you're going around, when you're orbiting the Earth, the way you orbit the Earth is that you always fall towards it but you move fast enough that you never get any closer to it. So when you're on the International Space Station, you're always in a state of free fall. Do you feel your weight when you're falling? You don't. Like if you've ever jumped off like the 10 meter diving platform at like a big swimming pool, while you're falling, you don't feel your weight. You feel the air rushing past you, but you feel weightless. And that's how the astronauts feel on the International Space Station. They're not really weightless. They're attracted to the Earth, but because they're always falling towards it, and never get any closer. They always feel weightless. Okay, so it's kind of weird, but it's true. Okay, you have to get pretty far away from the Earth to be truly weightless. All right. Um, so a rock uh, perched on a cliff in a in a Roadrunner cartoon. You guys have probably seen like you know R Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote. Okay. Um, he seems to disobey the laws of physics, provided he doesn't realize he's not standing on the cliff anymore. Okay. Which doesn't work in real life, by the way. Just keep that in mind. All right. Um, so Wiley e. Coyote, he has potential energy, as does a stretched rubber band. That's one of his favorite, uh, you know, uh, gigs is that he he gets the rubber band stretched between the posts and he backs up into it, and that's how he figures he'll run as fast as the Roadrunner. Okay, he tries that one, and the rocket skates and and things like that. Okay, um, but all of those again are forms of energy. Rocket skates have chemical energy. Okay, the rubber band has elastic potential energy. Right, um, the anvil that he tries to drop on the Roadrunner, okay, that has gravitational potential energy, all that kind of stuff. Okay, um, so definition here that'll be important: gravitational potential energy is the potential energy of an object due to its position. Okay, diagram on the left: two people are lifting the same size block or sorry, moving the same size block to the top of that ramp. One person is lifting it to the top of the ramp and one of them is pushing it up the ramp. Who's doing more work? What's that? They're equal. It takes the same amount of work to push something up a ramp as it does to lift it to the top of the ramp. So what's the advantage of a ramp then? It's easier. Why is it easier? I'll show you. Okay, we got to remember that work is a change in energy. Okay? When both of these blocks are set at the top of this ramp, will they have the same amount of energy? Yeah. So it doesn't matter how they get there. It takes the same amount of energy to get there. It takes the same amount of work to get there because they'll have the same amount of energy when they get there. Okay? Work is a change in energy and since at the top of this ramp, they're both going to have the same amount of potential energy because they have the same mass gravity is the same for both of them and they're the same height off the ground they both have the same amount of energy so it takes the same amount of work to get them there everyone follow me on that okay now work is force times distance triangles I mean you guys have dealt with trigonometry a little bit before here you don't have to do any okay um, this distance here is it less than this distance yeah, the hypotenuse is always the longest side of the triangle, right? So this is a shorter distance. So this guy has to exert 
more force. Okay? We know that we have to do the same amount of work no matter which one of these situations we're in. The difference is it's easier to use the ramp because you can use less force over a greater distance. Okay? That's the whole purpose behind ramps. Okay? Ramps make work easier. They don't make less work. It is impossible to make less work. Okay? You can't do the same job okay, in two different ways and have one of them be less work. Right? It's impossible. They require the same amount of energy. They require the same amount of work. Right? But because you don't have to exert as much force here, okay, you can have okay, a, a less uh, strong person do this job. Okay? The Egyptians built the pyramids using really, really long ramps. Aliens did not help them. Okay? They just built really, really long ramps because what did they have a lot of in Egypt? Sand and slaves. Yeah. Okay. Sand and slaves. The two things you require to make big ramps and have people move huge rocks up them. Okay? You need two things, sand and slaves. Okay? So you have these ramps, and, and I've seen these things on the on the uh, like the history channel and stuff where they actually showed how long like at the end when they were putting the rocks at the top. People were pushing these rocks up ramps that were like a mile and a half long. Okay. We got lots of sand. Yeah, there's lots of sand around. So they could build these ramps that were really, 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 really long. Okay. And then they put the, the trees underneath the rocks and then they would roll them on the trees and then when the tree would come out the back, they'd move that one to the front. Okay. And they'd just keep rolling it up. Yeah. They didn't actually drag them. That would have been really hard. Okay. So they had the, the trees that they rolled them up on. Okay. Something like that anyway. Right? It would require the same amount of work as the alien spacecraft with its anti-gravity beam lifting the rock to the top, which is obviously what did not happen. Okay. All right. So does that make sense? Okay. That's the whole purpose behind the simplest machine, the inclined plane. Right? The simplest machine is the inclined plane. It's just a ramp. Okay. So remember that, because if you don't, you will become an inclined plane wrapped around an axis. You'll be screwed. Think about it. If you wrap this around an axis, it's a screw. That's how screws work. So if you're an inclined plane wrapped around an axis, you're screwed. Okay? But yeah, that's how a screw works. It's a ramp. Okay? You can turn this thing okay, into the wood because it's a ramp. It's just wrapped around an axis. Okay? It's way easier than pounding the thing in. All right, so yeah, that's how that works. It also grips a lot better in the long run. Okay, looking at this diagram here, okay, with the pulley. If I want to load this system up, I'm going to pull back on the blue box. Okay, when I pull back on the blue box, what happens to the red ball? It goes up. What have I done? Work, because I've given this system now what? Potential energy, okay? Now, why did I say I gave the system potential energy? Really, I only lifted the ball. Why did that give the box energy? Right, it'll slide forward. They're connected, okay? Any two objects that are connected are a system. We talked about systems the first day, okay? This would be an, an open system, obviously, okay? Um, but if I have this system here, when I let it go, the gravitational potential energy will be converted into what kind of energy? Kinetic, right. Okay, and that kinetic energy will mean that both of these things will fall. Which one will move faster? They gotta go at the same speed. It's a trick question. Okay? They gotta go at the same speed because they're they're connected. Okay? Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so here's the formula for gravitational potential energy. It's one we're going to use a lot okay, in this unit. Luckily, it's really, really easy to use. Right? It's really, really easy to manipulate because everything's just multiplied together. Right? So if I want to calculate potential energy, okay, I multiply mass by 9.81, the acceleration due to gravity. Okay, G is on your formula sheet. Multiply by the height. Okay, now. What are the units for energy? Joules. Okay, now we've got to have a look at that kind of unit analysis a little bit here. Okay, um, joules 
are a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Aren't you glad we called them joules? Yeah. Okay. Now, work is force times distance. And we said force a minute ago is mass times acceleration. Okay. We saw that back with the guy with the golf club in the truck. Okay. Everybody with me here? So force is mass times acceleration. If I multiply that by distance, I get work. Work makes you mad. Okay. Now, what are the units for mass? Kilograms. Okay. What are the units for acceleration? Meters per second squared. And what are the units for distance? Meters. Okay. So I'm taking kilograms, I'm multiplying it by meters per second squared, and I'm multiplying that by meters. Comes out to kilogram meters squared per second squared. So that's a joule. Okay. Okay. That's what's going to work here, right? Because this will be in kilograms. Okay. This will be in meters per second squared, and this will be in meters. So we're going to get kilogram meters squared per second squared for our units. All right. Here's the other thing. In chemistry, mass was always in grams. In physics, mass is always in kilograms. Something you're going to have to remember on your final exam, okay, because you'll have both kinds of questions. In physics, we always want things to be in kilograms. The way I remember that is, in physics, we do things A, right, and B, big. Okay? So in physics, you go big. Right? We always use kilograms. Chemistry deals with atoms, which are small, so we use grams. Okay. Kind of way you can remember it. All right, so first example here, I think you have this one in your notes package. If I lift a three kilogram box with an upward force one and a half meters above the surface of the earth to the top of a table, what's the potential energy of the box at its new position? All right, well, potential energy is mass times gravity times height, three kilograms times 9.81 times 1.5 equals 44.1 joules. Okay. All right. How many people have their formula sheet up? Take that out right now. Okay. So we just said to calculate the potential energy of that object. We did this, mass times gravity times height. It said in the question that it was lifted from the ground up to the top of this table that was one and a half meters. How much work did I do in that question? Works a change in energy, right? Okay. And we said anytime we see delta, delta means change. Mathematically, that means final minus initial. So really, does this mean the same thing? Okay. If the box had 44.1 joules of energy when it was sitting on the table, how much did it have when it was on the ground? Zero, right? What's its height on the ground? Zero, right? It can't fall any further. It's on the ground. So its height was zero. So what's m times g times zero? Zero. All right. So. If I had 44.1 joules of potential energy on the table, how much work did I do? 44.1, because I changed the energy that much. Okay, work is a change in energy. Right? That's what you're going to come up against a lot. Okay? I might make you do a calculation like that, and then I'll just throw out there, how much work did you do? And that should be automatic. It won't require any calculating. If I did 44.1 joules, if I, ch if I changed energy by 44.1 joules, 
that's how much work I did. Okay, I can't change the energy of an object without doing work. All right. Now, another thing to work to uh, look at here to work at. Let's get in my head. Okay, work is force times distance, but it's also final energy minus initial energy. What force do you work against when you lift something? You work against gravity. On your formula sheet, about three quarters of the way down, you'll see this formula here. Okay, you see the formula for weight. Okay, weight is a force, right? We say this wrong all the time. When someone asks, how much do you weigh? And you give them a number in kilograms, you didn't give them the answer they asked for. You give them the answer they wanted, but not the answer they asked for. Okay, if you tell them that you weigh something in kilograms, you didn't give them your weight, you gave them your, your mass. Okay, your weight is a force. It's actually measured in newtons. Okay, um, if I want to lose weight, I just go to the moon. I'll weigh a lot less there because the moon has less what? Less gravity. I'll weigh one-sixth what I weigh here. Okay? That's the ultimate weight loss plan. Go to the moon. Okay? Lose a ton of weight. Okay? Just don't lose any mass, right? which is what all those weight loss plans are actually doing. They're not making you lose weight. They're making you lose mass. Okay? Um, so if I'm doing work against gravity, this force then becomes the force of gravity, right? Okay? It's whatever force I'm working against. That's what gets substituted in here. Okay? So really, what I've done here is say force of gravity times distance equals the work I did. M times G times D. What do we call a vertical distance? Height. That's where that formula comes from. M times G times H is the force of gravity times the distance over which you lift something. Okay, so it's really just force times distance. Right? Just a manipulation of it. Okay, second example, if I've got a 55 kilogram diver standing on a platform, they have 5,400 joules of energy, 5,400 joules. Okay, I want to find the height of the platform. So now I've got to manipulate. Now, here's the good news about manipulating M times G times H. If I want to solve for any one of these terms, what do I do with the other two? Divide them away. Really easy to manipulate. All right? So I want to find height. Divide both sides by MG, and I've got height. Okay, So it's super easy to manipulate. All right, so that's what we do here. We take our potential energy, 5,400 joules. We divide it by mass times gravity, and that should really actually have a set of brackets around it because you would have to do the bottom first. Okay, and that'll give you that the person is on the 10-meter diving platform. Okay. Questions there? Okay, now kinetic energy. Okay, kinetic energy um, happens when an object is moving. All right, and kinetic energy is dependent on the mass of the object and how fast the object is moving. Okay, um, and and honestly, that's the science behind a lot of weapons. Okay, a lot of weapons are designed very simply around those two ideas. Okay, weapons are either incredibly big, or they are a small thing that moves incredibly fast. Okay, bullets. Okay, if somebody threw a bullet at you, you'd go, whatever. Okay, right? But when it's moving at well over the speed of sound, it can do a lot of damage, right? Because it's got a lot more energy. All right, so things don't have to be big to have a lot of energy. They just got to be moving really, really fast. All right. Okay, now I'm going to show you a couple of examples here, a couple of videos from YouTube of people breaking stuff. Okay. Now, the whole science behind this, like martial arts, you know, being able to break impossibly large things, okay, comes back down to basic physics. All right. If you want to break a piece of wood, all right, you have to exert a certain amount of force on it. 
All right. Now it's more complex than that. When you get right when you get right down to it, it's simple like that. But there's quite a bit more that goes into it. Okay. If you want to break a piece of wood, do you hit it with this part of your hand? Yeah. Okay. You want to hit it with like back in here. Okay, where the bones are a little bit stronger. Okay, things like that. All right. Um, if you're if you look at like lots of kind of martial arts forms, there's a lot of avoidance of using the hand. Okay, because the bones in the hand are they're easy to break. Okay, I mean you don't see typically in in boxing. Okay, guys with bare fists because they'll break their hands. Th their careers would be so short because their hands would be a mess. Okay, they often break their hands anyway, even though they've got the big padded gloves on. Okay, so you want to use parts of your body that are harder because they can be more effective at, at breaking things. Okay. All right, so I'm going to show you these. Uh, this martial arts club is having their I don't know, looks like their annual board breaking festivities or whatever. Okay, so they're all breaking wood, and uh, there's this one. It's kind of painful to watch because it's this older fellow, and he he takes like I don't know, it's got to be like 15 swings, and he just keeps and he's right on with the fist, and he just keeps going. And he just can't break it. It, it. Eventually he does, but okay, to watch this poor old guy just keep swinging at this board, it kind of gets painful after a while. Okay. Okay, so key here, if you want to do that kind of work, you have to have a fair amount of speed, okay? Speed is an important part of your kinetic energy and then how much work you can do, okay? Uh, so obviously if you're going to be breaking okay, boards and things like that with your bare hands, okay, well, you've got to be able to move those hands pretty quickly, right? And there's also obviously a huge mental component to that, okay? Yeah, you can really psych yourself out and when you do, you're actually more likely to get hurt. Right. Now, these guys don't just walk up, obviously, and go, hey, I, I decided today I'm going to break 22 sidewalk blocks. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of practice and stuff that goes into that, and part of that practice is, is that the more impacts your bones take, the stronger they get. Okay? And so they, I, actually, I saw a thing on the Discovery Channel a few years ago now, and they were looking at the science of martial arts, and they found that people who do a lot of this stuff have much denser bones in, their, in the parts of their body they used to strike than normal people do. Okay, simply because those impacts cause micro fractures in the bone that have to heal, and when they heal, they knit stronger than they did before. Okay, and then their bones get thicker and denser and stronger than your eyes would be. <coughs> okay, um, so anything that's moving obviously has kinetic energy because it can do work. Okay, um, moving molecules in a sound wave. Okay, if mole if air molecules didn't move and sound wasn't a form of energy, we wouldn't hear it. Right? Because when sound energy comes to our eardrum, our eardrum vibrates back and forth. Right? That vibration gets translated by our brain into sound. Okay? Um, a falling hammer can drive a nail into wood. Okay? Uh, moving molecules in steam can turn turbines. Okay? Anything that can move okay, can do work. All right, so a moving object has kinetic energy. When a solid object moves, all the molecules move in unison. And that was the difference when we talked about the guy with the golf club who hit the truck. Okay, the truck, all the molecules in the truck did not move in unison. They, that is, they didn't all move in a straight line together. If they had, the truck would have rolled. Okay, in this case, when he struck the truck, they moved all in a random fashion. That caused more of a vibration and and things like that. Okay, uh, so even when molecules are not physically attached to each other, they can still move together, like what happens with wind. Right? We've seen what kind of damage wind can do. Okay, I mean it rips, you know, shingles off of houses, and you know, in tornadoes it topples things, picks up mobile homes, and throws them around. Okay, that's because all those air molecules, and when you get a lot of them together, that's a fair amount of mass. Okay, air has mass, and when it gets moving, okay, it can do a lot of work. Okay, with our roller coaster example here, hey, okay, uh, in a roller coaster you usually towed to the top of the first hill, which is the highest hill on the ride, and th up there you would have what kind of energy? Yeah, you'd have some potential. You'd have some kinetic because you'd be moving. Okay, And remember, we talked about this way back at the beginning of the unit. Mechanical energy is the total of both your kinetic and your potential. So at any point on this roller coaster, if it exists in the perfect physical world, you would have the same amount of mechanical energy. Here, most of that mechanical energy would be potential, but as you go down the hill, it would turn into kinetic because your height here is less than your height here. 
Okay, but down here, your speed is greater than your speed was up here. All right, so you're turning one into the other, back and forth, okay, throughout this whole thing. All right, formula for kinetic energy. EK equals one half times the mass times V squared. Okay, so if I double the mass of an object, I can double its kinetic energy. If I double the speed of an object, I quadruple its energy. Okay, speed has a exponential relationship with energy and work. All right, so the faster you go exponentially, you have more kinetic energy and thus more ability to do work. Okay, so E is the kinetic energy of the object, M is the mass in kilograms, V is, and this should say speed, okay, because we actually use a scalar one here, okay, uh, speed of the object in meters per second. Okay, and that formula will still produce the proper units for energy, mass will be in kilograms, and speed squared is meters squared per second squared, okay, because the units square as well, and that gives us kilogram meters squared per second squared, which are joules. All right, I'm going to show you a little example here. They should teach you in driver's ed, but they don't. Okay, this is the work energy theorem. Work is a change in energy. If I'm driving along and I'm going, let's say I'm in a playground zone, I'm going 30 kilometers an hour, I have a certain amount of energy. If I want to stop, what do I have to do with that energy? I have to decrease. I got to get rid of it. I have to make it do work on something else. How do we stop our car? The brakes. Okay. The brakes convert mechanical energy into into heat. Okay. If if uh, it's, it's really cool to watch. Have you ever seen night racing uh, when they're going around the track? You can actually see when they apply the brakes because they glow. There's a big red circle inside the wheels. Okay? The brake rotor glows cherry red okay, when they go around the corners. Right? And the same thing is true for your brakes. You just don't usually see it. We're not going fast enough to actually make them glow. But they get really hot when you apply them. So we're turning our mechanical energy into heat. It's doing work then. Okay? And as a result, our car slows down. Okay, everybody with me there? All right. Work's a change in energy. Work is force times distance, and I'm trying to change my kinetic energy. Okay. Whoop. My kinetic energy into essentially nothing. Okay. Work's a change in energy. So what I'm saying here is force times distance equals final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. Everyone okay with that? Yeah. Okay. If I'm trying to stop, what's my final kinetic energy going to be? Zero. All right. I'm just going to take that out. Okay. If it's zero, I don't even need to have it in there. So force times distance equals my initial kinetic energy. I've got to get rid of all that. That's how much work I have to do in order to stop. All right. So let's come up with some theoretical numbers here. Let's say my brakes can, do, can exert, I don't know, let's say 5,000 now it's probably more than that. Let's say they can exert 8,000 newtons of force. Okay, that's how much force that my brakes can exert when they're squeezed against the, the brake rotors. All right. And let's say I'm traveling at 30 kilometers per hour, which is I think it's 8.6, but we'll double check here. Eight point three. Okay, so I'm traveling at thirty kilometers per hour, which is eight point three meters per second. Okay, so that's my speed. This is my force. Okay, let's say the mass of my car uh, is two thousand kilograms. Okay, I want to figure out how long it's going to take me to stop. Okay, so I'm looking for d. So how do I manipulate this formula? to get d by itself. Divide by f. Right. Okay. Divide both sides by f. All right. 
So D equals one half MVI squared over F. So at 30 kilometers an hour, so one half times 2,000 kilograms times 8.3 squared divided by 8,000 newtons. It's going to take me 8.6 meters to stop from 30 kilometers an hour. Okay, so the distance at 30 kilometers per hour is 8.6 meters. How much further is it going to take me to stop if I'm going only 10 kilometers an hour faster? Any ideas? I'm just putting a scenario out there that we all do, right? When we drive along, how many of you go 10 kilometers an hour over the speed limit? I don't do it in a playground zone or a school zone, but okay, I'll admit I do it everywhere else. Okay, um, if we do that in a, in a school zone, okay, or a playground zone, here's how that here's here's what happens. Okay, so now I'm going 40 kilometers per hour. Okay, so I'm going to convert that to meters per second. So it's 11.1. .1. So I'm going to do this same calculation, okay? Same numbers, right? It's still the same car. weighs It has a mass of 2,000 kilograms, okay? Now times 11.1 .1 squared, my new speed, divided by same brakes, 8,000 newtons. Ten kilometers an hour nearly doubles your stopping distance because it takes almost twice as much work to stop you. Speed and work have an exponential relationship. The faster you go, it will require you to have exponentially more distance to stop. Okay? If you are going 60 in a 30 kilometer an hour zone, you will require four times as much distance to stop as someone going the speed limit. That is the difference between someone having a child come home that night or not. Guys, 10 kilometers an hour makes a difference of almost 8 meters in your stopping distance. That's almost the length of this classroom. If a kid runs out in front of you in a playground zone, even 10 kilometers an hour will make the difference between whether you can stop or not. Think about it. That's something they should teach you in driver's ed, but don't. Okay? That's the physics of why there are speed limits in certain places. Please drive the speed limit in playground zones and school zones especially. Construction zones too. Okay? That's why speed finds double in a construction zone. Yeah? All right, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Hey, labs are due tomorrow, okay? Your need for speed labs, make sure they're done.